Welcome to the Regeneration International Podcast. Okay, so I'm Alexis Badenmare. I'm the political director of the Organic Consumers Association. And our first speaker is Nate Kleinman. Nate Kleinman came to farming through political activism, most notably his participation in the Occupy movement and mutual aid efforts in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. He came to the conclusion that regenerative organic agriculture, permaculture, seed saving, plant breeding, and community gardening are the most powerful tools we have to address climate change and create social justice. In 2013, Nate Kleiman co-founded the Experimental Farm Network, an open, easy to use online platform for participatory plant breeding and other agricultural research. The Environmental Farm Network spreads knowledge and seeds to people working cooperatively over the long term to develop new crops and growing systems capable of mitigating or even reversing the effects of global climate change. In 2020, Nate launched the Cooperative Gardens Commission, a grassroots collective working toward food sovereignty in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and persistent injustice. Welcome, Nate. Thanks, Alexis. Really glad to be here. All right. Well, um, I'll let you share your screen and I'll mute myself while you do that. All right, I'm going to uh, get started here. Um, okay, here we go. So uh, the topic that I'm speaking about today is um, how do we really feed the world? Uh, if you pay attention to the giant agribusiness corporations, they always tell you that they have the answer, that they are the only way that we're going to feed the world in the future. Um, but uh, in reality, what they offer is uh, is the opposite. They offer a recipe for starvation and dislocation and um, increased climate change. Um, so as Alexis mentioned, my my story in this work begins in New, in, uh, New Jersey with Hurricane Sandy. Um, this was uh, Union Beach. Which, uh, which got really slammed right across the bay from Raritan Bay from New York City. Um, I'm gonna talk just a brief, brief bit about um, the, some of the effects of climate change that are coming down the pike. Uh, this is the Muir Glacier in Alaska, 1941 to 2004, the photo taken in roughly the same spot. Um, I recently had the chance to fly over part of Southern Greenland and um, you can actually see these rivers of ice, uh, these glaciers um, flowing into the ocean, and it, it's increasing at such a such a rate right now. This is a, a new story from just about a week ago. Uh, a new uh, the NASA's NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab capturing fresh signs of rapidly melting glaciers in Greenland. Um, and you know when the when the polar ice caps melt, when the when the uh, when Antarctica eventually melts and the Greenland ice cap melts, this is what the map of the U.S. is is going to to look like, um, and uh, and you see most of the Caribbean there as well, and Mexico and Canada. It's uh, it's a true disaster, but we don't have to wait for that to happen for disasters. Uh, we're already seeing them all the time. Uh, this is a, a, a image of what it looked like in between 1961 and 1979. This map shows the number of days above 100 degrees. Most parts of the United States had less than 10 days above 100 degrees um, on average in a year. You can see different in the Southwest in Texas, they have some more. Uh, this is what the current projections show for uh, just 60 years from now. We're going to have in, in New Jersey where I am, we're going to have 45 or 50, 60 days over 100 degrees every year. Um, that's going to have a huge effect on, on agriculture, on, on our ability as a species to feed ourselves. Um, we really are not ready for this. It's, it's accelerating and, and um, we, uh, if we rely on these giant corporations, we will, we will never, uh, never make it. Um, this map shows the uh, dry places in the world where there's a drought and where they're having excessive uh, wet years between 2000 and 2009. Um, this is the projection for 2030 to 2039. You can see drought conditions in some of the most 
productive parts of uh, of the world, including the the bulk of the United States. Um, and then this is what is projected for 2060 to, to 2069. Um, we're we're getting awfully close to that, and um, the effects are going to be really really horrific. Already we have we have terrible droughts in in many important food producing parts of the world. Uh, so you know people understand that emissions is a is responsible in large part for uh, for climate change, um, but uh, and and of course. Uh, the um, extractive industries, oil and gas, and coal in particular. Um, but agriculture plays a huge role, especially industrial agriculture in climate change. Uh, this, this is from the IPCC in 2014. The estimate is that agriculture, forestry, and land use, uh, other land use, is, is responsible for 24% of all global greenhouse gas emissions, which is about on par with electricity and heat production. It's more than heavy industry, more than transportation, more than buildings and, and other energy. So this is a this is a huge driver of climate change. And a big part of, of uh, what is driving carbon emissions in agriculture is simple, uh, the simple act of tillage. Every time you till the soil, you are releasing carbon from the atmosphere. You're destroy uh, into the atmosphere. You're destroying the soil microorganisms, the life in the soil that are responsible for soil's ability to to capture so much carbon. And it's the same whether you use a tractor or horses. If you're tilling the ground up, you are releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Um, our farming system in this country, which we are increasingly exporting around the world, is based on monoculture, growing one crop over a huge area. Um, and the the majority of the crops that we grow in this country are corn, which is all almost all genetically modified, soybeans, uh, same story, wheat, which um, thankfully it has uh, ha uh, genetically modified wheat has not been has not been approved, um, although there are some some that has escaped from experimental plantings. Uh, into wild populations of other grasses, um, sugar beets, which are genetically modified, and canola, which is as well. Um, and all of this, uh, all of these crops, these are the uh, underlying ingredients for the vast majority of foods that you see on the shelves in uh, in the average supermarket. And all of those colors, all of that, uh, all that different branding obscures the fact that. Uh, that there is not a whole lot of diversity in our uh, in our food system in in the the things that we are actually eating, um, and uh, you can see so much of that is based in uh, in the um, the corporate landscape of this country. All of these huge multinational corporations that have all of these tinier brands that they've bought up through the years. So it looks like you know you you might buy Cheerios and Lucky Charms and Golden Grams. Um, you're you're supporting one company when you do when you do that, um, and it's the same in the seed industry. Uh, I was using this this um, image for a long time when I would give talks um, from Phil Howard at Michigan State University. This shows the consolidation in the seed industry, um, but actually he recently updated it because of the uh, because of um, e even further consolidation in uh, in in the corporate landscape here. Um, and this is a huge problem for, for biodiversity, uh, for the food system. We are relying on these massive corporations to provide seeds for, uh, for so much of what is grown and consumed by people around the world. Um, and when you have a system like this, that's all based on monoculture, you are destroying the land, you're destroying people's livelihoods as well. It, it's harder and harder for farmers to compete in this system, especially small farmers, and um, and it's terrible for the for the environment, for the climate, for biodiversity, for natural habitats. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about agrobiodiversity, which is the um, which is biodiversity of all of the species that we use in agriculture. Um, this is a this pretty simple chart shows the number of varieties of of a few different crops that were offered by commercial seed houses in 1903, a sampling of just 10 crops. And then 80 years later, 1983, which of those crops from this survey were found in the National Seed Storage Laboratory? Which do 
farmers still have access to and and plant breeders and you can see um you know 497 varieties of lettuce shrunk down to 36 uh 408 peas down to 25. this is a huge tragedy not just for for culture um, but this is this is problematic for for the future of our food supply. Genetic diversity is at the root of our ability to make advancements, to make a more resilient food system, and make sure that we have enough food um, to survive the uh, uh, the latest virus uh, that that's going to attack potatoes or um, the latest pest insect pest that's going to attack squash. Um, and as the climate changes pests and diseases are spreading and increasing as well. Um, there's um, right now it's you're not allowed to import any tomato or pepper seeds into the United States because uh, because there's a virus that uh, that we're afraid of bringing here. Um, this uh, this is the Irish lumper potato, which is well known um, for being the main potato grown in Ireland just before the potato famine. Uh, while this is the this is just a sample of uh, of the biodiversity you might see in a market in Peru of of potatoes, uh, but in Ireland they were growing just that that one potato. Most people know this story. If you have a diversity of potatoes and a blight hits, all of the ones that are susceptible to that will die. But with the di diversity, you'll have some that survive. If you only have one and they are susceptible to the blight, they're all going to die. Um, but we can be creating new varieties of potato by planting the potato, true potato seeds that grow on these little berries that come after the potato flowers. Um, you get a little plant, looks like a little similar to a little tomato plant, and then you get new potato varieties. Um, and this is the kind of work that more and more people need to be doing. Um, I'm going to talk real quick about the concept of a land race, which is a population of cultivated plants that has a historical origin, distinct identity, and lacks formal crop improvement, as well as being often genetically diverse, locally adapted, and associated with tr traditional farming systems. Um, there's a slightly longer one here. But basically, a uh, land race is a population um, that is that is grown by a traditional farming community. And it because it, ha it, has, it lacks formal crop improvement, there's a lot of diversity in these populations. And almost all of the varieties of crops that are grown around the world have their roots in a traditional land race, like those those potatoes. Um, or uh, this is a land race okra from Afghanistan. This is a land race squash from the Nanticoke people in southern Delaware and, and the eastern shore of Maryland. This is another one of those squash. Um, this is some land race wheat from, uh, from Turkey. And these are land race... Uh, corns from Mexico. This is just a small sample of the uh, existing biodiversity uh, in, in Mexico in corn. Um, there's also uh, an, a movement among seed people to uh, in, in the organic and small-scale seed community to create um, what you might call synthetic land races, which are populations that are incredibly diverse. They are created that way They from bringing together other traditional varieties and and uh, developing something that's uh, that's more diverse, in order to um, to create something more resilient for farmers and also for plant breeders, so that uh, people have uh, have um, more, much more diversity to to base the next generation of plants on. These are some uh, uh, dry bush beans from uh, Joseph Lofthouse in Utah, um, and these are these are uh, this is a synthetic pea land race from uh, Wild Mountain Seeds in Colorado, both of which. Uh, my nonprofit sells. Um, crop wild relatives are critical to maintaining crop biodiversity around the world. Uh, these are plants that live in the wild that are the uh, that are relatives of our of our crop plants. This is a, a wild sunflower that is a close relative of the domesticated sunflower. Um, but there is a we have a huge problem with um, biodiversity of uh, of um, crop wild relatives disappearing. This is the, this map shows where there's global hotspots of distributions of uh, crop wild relatives that are in urgent need of further collecting because there are not enough of them in gene banks. Quite a quite a few in the United States. The Mediterranean is a hotspot. Um, Indonesia, uh, Brazil, and uh, China, um, among many other places. Um, it's really really important that we get 
these crops into gene banks and that people start working with them. Uh, but it's also critical that we preserve the natural landscapes, the, the, the places where these things live, the habitats where these important crops, uh, reservoirs of genetic diversity live. Um, here's just a few of uh, few in, in the US. Um, and some of these crops for, for breeders who are looking for them are available through the USDA seed banks. Um, you, can, you can find this, the, the link is there at the bottom right of this slide, ars-grin.gov. And um, they will release this germplasm, any propagated material, seeds, tubers, bulbs, um, uh, cyan wood cuttings, to anyone who has a legitimate research, breeding, educational, or um, repatriation purpose. Um, so it's it's so important that we switch from a massive um, monoculture, chemical intensive system to agroecology, which I, I won't talk too much about, but basically it's a, a system, agroecology is a system that mimics natural systems. Um, it's the way most traditional farming uh, communities have practiced agriculture for millennia. And it's the way many traditional farming communities still practice agriculture today. It involves a mix of, of uh, species, um, trees in the canopy, bushes and sub smaller trees in the sub canopy, and then other plants, annual plants and perennials um, on the ground. And um, this is what we need to do all over the place. We need to switch to agroecology if we're actually going to survive um, in the future. The, the vast majority of farms and farmland in this country is growing these genetically modified foods that are a dead end. Um, but the biodiversity that can exist in an agroecological system is, uh, is, is where we have to go. Um, this is a really uh, important little chart from the uh, Latin American uh, summary. Uh, yeah, this is, um, uh, yeah, source Latin America and the Caribbean summary for decision makers. I'll, uh, I, I can put the uh, actual source I got from this thing from. Um, but basically, we need to transition from our conventional system into something that's improved, which um, things like your, your typical organic farm is certainly an improvement. But ultimately, we need to learn from indigenous and traditional systems and switch to uh, fully agroecological systems to, to actually have something that's sustainable for the future. Um, we need to preserve the biodiversity of threatened farming communities around the world. This is a, this is a melon from the Maldives, which are going to be one of the first countries under the, uh, under the waves as the climate changes. This is a, a thin, thin hulled uh, pumpkin seed from Moldova, which is a community under great threat from, um, from poverty and people leaving Moldova because there's no economic opportunity there in Eastern Europe. This is a watermelon from Syria, which is of course threatened by war, by drought. Um, another, a tomato from Syria. These are, uh, uh, this is a refugee farm in Lebanon where they're growing some Syrian varieties from seeds that we, uh, that my nonprofit got, uh, got over there. Uh, this is my friend Simon with some uh, some sorghum uh, from South Sudan, where he's from. Um, we uh, do a lot of work getting seeds back to the communities where they came from, because so many traditional communities have been um, have been divorced from their uh, from their traditional agricultural heritage. Um, but these many communities around the world, uh, this is a this is a local seed bank in India. Are, are doing amazing work preserving what is left of the, the biological agricultural heritage. Yeah, um, this, this is so awesome, Nate. <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous photos. And you have collected seeds from all over the world. I hope that everybody gets in touch with you at the Experimental Farm Network. It's, it's a true experiment. You can participate in the EFN projects. You can get seeds from EFN. I put the link to your shop in the site in the on the site as well in Thanks. the chat. And um, everybody should get involved with Co-op Gardens, the Cooperative Gardens Commission. And Nate, I hope we have a chance to talk again very soon. Thank you so much for this me, fantastic me, presentation. Me too. But yeah, I hope that folks will uh, will check, out, check us out and learn some about um, the importance of breeding new crops to fight climate change and um, develop a more sustainable system. Thanks. Thanks, Alexis. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nate. See you soon. Bye-bye.